guys. Welcome to a brand new series. This is going to be a fashion design lecture series based off of several questions that I've been receiving lately from subscribers. I figured the best way to do it was to just do just e explain the whole design process to you guys and then you guys can glean whatever it is that you need. This video is gonna cover the basics of the entire design process, and I'm going to illustrate that with this project that I put together as a teaching tool last summer. And then future videos will go over each step of the design process more in depth. And if you have specific questions that you wanna make sure that I address, feel free to drop me a comment below. The basics of design process are these. You're taking an inspiration, whatever inspires you, you know, it can be anything really basic from a movie that you like all the way to something really weird and strange and dark, all the way to something abstract and esoteric. Whatever it is that you like, you're taking this sort of vague, inspiration mood and you're going to through a series of steps turn it into something concrete and every step along that process you're turning everything into something more and more tangible you're not going to start sketching until step four like you have a lot of work to do before you start scribbling designs whether you're figuring out the design direction on your own or you're getting design direction from a teacher or a boss, the number one reason why you don't wanna start sketching right away is if you start sketching without doing research, that just means that you're putting down on paper old ideas that have been rattling around in your brain. And that doesn't really lead to anything interesting, anything new and fresh regurgitating crap that's been sitting around in your brain deep in the recesses and you're putting them on paper and that does not help you. So the first few steps are research and development and then we move on to sketching. So this project, I named it Lux Utility because I was focusing this project on something that is luxurious but also useful and not superfluous. I wanted something where it was very form follows function, and I wanted something that were investment pieces, they would last a long time, you would want to keep wearing them. And so I researched furniture and interiors. When people spend money on furniture and interiors, most of the time their approach is a little bit different than when they buy clothes. Like they expect furniture and interiors to last and be around for a long time. Most people don't go into changing their house up every six months like they do with their clothing wardrobe. And so they're a little bit more careful with their purchases and they do spend a little bit more money expecting, you know, more out of it. I researched interesting textures and materials. I looked at furniture. I looked at interior fabrics and wall treatments. And I looked at um, glass and wood, stained glass. I looked at churches. I looked at homes. I looked at ice hotels. I was looking at brocades. I was looking at furs. I was looking at composition and layout of different interiors. and. As I was thinking about these interiors, I was also thinking, you know what? When people buy furniture, it's not always a masculine thing or a feminine thing like men's wear and women's wear. Like sure, there are looks where people as associate them more masculine, but it's not like clothing where it's like, oh, these are boy clothes and these are girl clothes and these are very small children's clothes. You buy a couch and it's for everybody. And so I went in thinking, oh, I'm gonna make this androgynous, but also all ages. You're gonna start your design process with a mood board and you're gonna start collecting images. And uh, <laughs> it might seem hypocritical of me to say this, but when you're doing your visual research, 
you need to get off the internet. Uh, I know you found me on the internet and I live on the internet. And, you know, for most of you, I'm just like this random person on the internet. And you're like, uh, why would you tell us to get off the internet? Because there are so many resources for you guys that are offline. You need to go utilize them. Go to the library and go look up some books, make color copies of some really interesting images. Go look at some magazines. Although I highly encourage at this stage to stay away from clothing or historical costumes as your references, because those are things that already exist to adorn the body. And therefore you're just regurgitating old stuff. You want to, you know, maybe you want to go look at a fishing magazine and look at pictures of fish and other wildlife and trees and creeks and be inspired by calm atmospheres, you know, nature, sunshine, moving water, things like that. But notice I don't have, while I have textures that can be translated to fabric, I don't have anything here that's clothing. The clothing, that'll come later, but this is more about mood. You know, I have a very opulent mood, per, you know, throughout. Go for mood. And then you're going to start thinking about color and texture and fabric. When you are putting together your color story, you'll be pulling things from your mood board. You'll be pulling mood images that have a color scheme that you like. I've had, you know, lots of designers like to look at a painting for a reference because they like the colors like they might not like the shapes or the mood of the painting but they really love the colors and they'll use that as kind of a beginning point for their color story color story consists of a few different topics to consider uh number one the individual colors mm. <laughs> when you're thinking about colors you need to think about how much contrast you want to play with to get the effect that you want. So if you want a collection that's very muted and soft and kind of harmonious, you wouldn't have a lot of jarring pop colors that pull your eyes focus in a lot of different directions, but have colors that really sort of, you know, blend together well. On the other hand, that can sometimes look boring. And so you need to be careful of that. You need to think about your color psychology. I know it's different for every culture, but we do have psychological associations attached to each color. Here in the US, we all wear black to funerals. Brides wear white. Uh, because those are our associations. Black is for death. Black is for mourning. And white is pure virginal all that kind of thing that's why like when you watch things like say yes to the dress like women who have been married before uh and are buying a dress for their second wedding their second marriage you know people say things like oh you know i think i'm gonna wear a champagne colored dress because w wearing white just seems kind of ridiculous at my age don't you like i hear people say that it's like no one actually thinks you're a virgin not even if you're getting married for the first time. So whatever. But we have these associations in our minds when it comes to color. And, you know, you'll have the Indian bride showing up to say yes to the dress saying, no, 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 we don't wear white when we get married. We wear red. So I'm looking for a dress where you, the designer will let me dye the whole thing red. See, everybody has these ideas of color. And so you got to think like, you know, what is the image I'm trying to project with my colors. And then you have to think about color proportions. So if you have a collection and you decide you want to do the colors red, yellow, and blue, how you use those three colors is going to change people's perception of the entire color story. If you have just a lot of red, a lot of blue, and a lot of yellow, you know, people think things like Legos, children's toys, primary color, something cheerful. Uh, maybe they think Snow White, maybe they think Superman, but you know, uh, youthful and fun and fictional and those kinds of things. Now, if you were to do it 
overwhelmingly red and yellow and you wanted it more like fiery autumn leaves colors and then you just have pops of blue here and there for contrast, that's one very particular mood. On the other hand, if you did an overwhelmingly blue color story, different shades and tones of blue, and you wanted things to look more muted and calm, and you were inspired by water, and then you added some dull red and yellow accents in there, that mood is really different from your red and yellow heavy mood. So color, what kinds of color, you know, the psychology behind each color and the proportions in which you use the colors. And then I will show you how to play with colors and how to put together your color story. You also have to think about texture because the way someone sees a bright fire engine red shiny PVC is really different from how people see a nubbly fuzzy red boucle. You know, people think, ooh, red vinyl, like that's all hooker's trench coat and thigh high boots and whatnot. And then when they see red boucle, they think, oh, adorable pea coat on school teachers on a fall day. I don't know, I just made that up, but you kind of see where I'm going, where people have these perceptions connected to the color with the texture. Mm. So we're gonna be playing with texture. I'm gonna show you guys some techniques as to how to play with and develop textures for your projects. And then you have to think about fabrics. You have to have a variety of fabrics in different weights so that you can have a well-merchandised collection. If you are someone who only does, say, a line of blouses, that's fine. All you need to do is find lightweight materials that you can make blouses out of. But if you are doing a whole, like, you know, tops and bottoms and dresses and outerwear collection, then you need specific fabrics for all those things. So as I was playing with colors and textures, I put together two different color fabric stories together. This is my red and brown and gray and gold sort of um, color story with these chartreuse pops. And I have fabrics of different weights. I have these chunky hand knits for sweaters. I have this metallic brocade that's quite stiff for outerwear. I have this range of woolens, mostly tweeds, uh, for outerwear, for more simple, closer to the body outerwear. I have some furs for trim. I have some novelty fabrics that I might make into dresses. And I have these top weights here, these soft, slinky silks for blouses. Uh, drapey dresses, and then I have some t-shirt materials, these heathered t-shirt knits and a couple of meshes. Not to say I'm going to use all of them, but I'm collecting them to kind of build on my story and look at how I'm using color and texture. And then I put this one together where it's more cool tone, lots of different purples with some pinks, and then I'm kind of like I'm you know, chartreuse is one of my favorite colors. It's a weakness of mine. So I threw in some chartreuse. I love the concept of doing gradients. As you can see here, this is a more gra grainy gradient. This one is a little bit more subtle. And this is where I'm getting some of my browns. And then I'm weaving some warm grays into this purple. And then I have you know, some browns and whites and grays and this fur, I have shearlings, and then I have this much thinner hand knit for tops. Mood board, color, texture, fabric. And so once we've explored all these things, and at this point they're all still kind of vague, right? But you see how we start from a very vague mood and then we're kind of like firming things up with a color story and then textures that go with these colors and then actual fabrics that kind of fuse all of that together. And now we're gonna get even more specific and start sketching. So now we're sketching. Finally, we're at sketching. You're gonna do more visual research. You're going to pull shapes and lines from your visual research images. I'm gonna show you a bunch of different ways to do that. And you're gonna start designing. And you're 
slapping down croquis. These are super fast. I am making multiple copies of each design so that, you know, for this one, I'm going to try these colors. And for this one, I'm going to try these colors. And then I'm going to Xerox the same silhouette. And I'm going to change some of the design details. Like maybe I want a different kind of pocket and a different collar, but I have all these millions of notes and repeats and development because you know what? Your first few designs are basically going to suck. They are. They're going to be a combination of the new stuff, old shit that's been rattling around in your head, you know, and also kind of like your default designs. Everyone, every designer has a kind of a set of default designs, kind of a default design aesthetic that kind of sits around. And other, you know, some people are like, but that just means that's your style. And like, that's fine. Everyone's always going to have a style. They really have a hard time not designing in their style. But you also need to push yourself and develop new. And later on, as you're editing, you'll edit out the things that you don't think are cohesive to your style. But you still need to go out there and push yourself and develop and develop and develop. So sketching, notes, redos, redevelopment, and also merchandising. Uh, you know, you get to a point where you're like, oh, you know what? I didn't design any short jackets. All I have are super long coats. And, you know, some people need a shorter jacket. As you're sketching, you will also be putting together real live sewn samples with your actual fabrics. And this step kind of mimics the way things would work in the industry where you meet with your fabric guys, you order your sample yardage, you come back to the office, you're sketching, you're putting together muslins, and then you get your sample yardage, and then you start making samples and having fittings. This, this right here, this is an important part of the design process. So many students think that this is just an afterthought, a way of ex helping illustrate the designs, but it's not. This is the most important step of the design process. I know I'm an illustration teacher and I love drawing more than anything, but when I'm in design mode, it's really important, you guys, that you remember that our ultimate goal as designers is to put fabric on a body. And so you can draw all the beautiful, whimsical things that you want. And if you're an illustrator, that's fine. But if you're a designer, you have to think at the end of the day, how's that going to work on the body? How's that going to work when I actually make it with the final fabric? And so this is essential in your design process. So, you know, these are the finals, of course, because I kept the nice ones. But this is where, oh, I'm going to try quilting this leather. That's really big. I'm going to try a smaller pattern. And then here I'm like, oh, I could have used a contrast top stitch. Maybe, maybe not. Here I tried various laser cutting with like having a contrast fabric in the back, tried different color combinations, different shapes. Here I started with the brocade and then I wanted it to be thicker, more important. And so I quilted it and I'm like, oh, that's not enough. So I started studying it. And then I have a variety of ways that I was playing with chains and the mesh, something light, something hard. And then here I was weaving leather with chains. And here I was cutting different paillets and layering them together to create this really exaggerated large scale sequin that is not shiny. I don't know, it made sense in my head at the time, right? So I'm working here, I'm processing, I'm sewing, I'm, I'm trying things in muslin before I move things onto final fabrics, and then I'm sketching. I tried the quilting on this dress, I tried the paillets on the dress, I made paillets happen, and then the quilting, it's like, that's a little puffy for evening wear. So maybe I'll stay here because it's nice and flat. I'm dangling chains on various sweaters, I have chains, woven into the leather. I'm like, ah, uh, okay, what's that really going to look like? And how much is that going to weigh? Like, is it going to drape funny because it's too heavy? I should probably do a swatch so I can figure out what that's like. At this stage, I would also take yardage of my final fabrics and pin them on the mannequin and try different uh, drapes and then take photos as my notes. And that's what all this step is. This is all of it together. Design, development, 
redevelopment, sampling, redevelopment, sampling, merchandising, and see how we're getting more and more concrete. Loose sketches, fabric development, tighter sketches with more details, more development. And then flats. Most people think that flats are not as fun to do as the figure drawings, um, but I don't care. And the industry doesn't care because if you're a working designer, you're going to be working with flats more than anything in terms of drawing things. And so you have to get good at flats. I have a whole series on how to draw flats. Go watch those. I'm not going to really explain the technicals of actually drawing flats so much in this series, but understand that this is where you are solidifying every single small detail of your designs. So you have your loose sketches, you have your fabric samples, you know what's going to work on the body and what's not, or you have a better idea. Like you don't really know until you actually put the whole garment together, but you're here and this is where you get the most exacting, where you are like really getting the nitty gritty of each proportion, each line of top stitching, each pocket placement, each size of collar. Okay. And you get super detailed with all of the things. And then as you're here, you have to take into consideration the final fabrication of each garment and how that's going to affect the construction of your garment. You don't construct silk chiffon the same way as you would construct leather. The figures at this point will come at the very last and they're almost an afterthought, really. But this is the sexy Right? This is where you seduce people into thinking that your designs are a good idea. <laughs> so this is where it's like, oh, I put all the designs together. I fabricated everything. I've worked out all my proportions. I played around with some rendering concepts. I figured out my faces and my accessories. And now I'm going to put them all together. And here we go. Don't you want to get this collection made? Don't you want to wear it? Don't you want to sell it? When you're showing your portfolio to people, this is where you're like, okay, this is where it all came together, all that research and development and, and hard work culminated into these kind of final images, right? This is where you show off the style and the mood of your muse, your customer. You think about how you imagine the clothes coming down the runway and what kind of models they would be on and what kind of accessories they would be wearing. So that even if you're not an accessories designer, you do have to think about how things are going to be worn together. And that's it. That is the basics of the fashion design process for building a collection. If you have a question, check the info box. If it's not there, drop me a comment. I know that some of you are still waiting for your subscriber request videos. And yeah, you know, the queue goes in the order that I receive the requests and I get a lot of them <laughs> and I enjoy it. I haven't made a non-subscriber request video in quite some time. Just be patient, wait your turn, I'll get to it. And that's it. And I will be coming back in a few weeks with the first step of the design process. Until then, go watch some other videos, go practice, or you know what? Go to a museum and take some pictures and buy some postcards and, and start thinking about maybe some inspiration for a design project you want to work on for your portfolio. All right. See you next time.